to the PCA again. So maybe we go back to the formula. Yes. Um, so what we first do is we calculate the covariance matrix. And then, I mean, we have to solve this eigenvalue equation for the covariance matrix S. Then we get the eigenvalues uh, lambda m. Um, yeah, and the eigenvalues, they, the size of the eigenvalues, I mean, these eigenvalues, they are, they are all positive. And the size of these eigenvalues uh, gives us the variance in the direction of the uh, respective um, eigenvector. Yeah? So the, the spectrum of the eigenvalues is quite interesting when for our uh, data set we uh, solve the eigenvalue equation. So we see that the principal component, uh, I mean that's the definition of the principal component, has the largest eigenvalue. But here we see there is quite a big difference between the largest eigenvalue and the next ones. Um, okay, and uh, I gave you this, these Lexmate data as the exercise. And then uh, when, uh, in the exercises session uh, last week, um, some students showed me nice pictures. What they did is they projected the data onto the two largest eigenvalues because this can be easily visualized on the screen. Yeah? And now if we do this with the raw Lexmate data, the not normalized Lexmate data, then we get this plot. Yeah? Um, and I mean the reason is, I mean here you don't see much structure. It looks like an almost random distribution of points. Um, but the reason is quite simple. The reason is in the not normalized Lexmate data, here, here you see the data. If you don't normalize these data, then of course the leukocyte value is by far the largest value and therefore the variance will dominate all the other variances extremely. Um, and then there is this uh, the H which is the next value with a large variance because the H varies between something like uh, 3 and 90 years. Yeah? So the variance of the age also is quite large. Uh, I mean even though these values are bigger because I mean these are the fever values without the decimal point but the variance is quite small because it's values between 360 and uh, 400. Yeah? Um, so the variance is around 40 here no, it, it's even smaller. It, the variance would be around 20, but here the variance uh, is something like uh, 60. Yeah? Um, okay, and that's why, I mean, so we, uh, we could already know in advance that the principal component would more or less be the leukocyte value. Yeah? And that's actually what happens. If you look at here, we have, uh, sorry, it's, it's cut on the slide. Uh, the principal uh, component, which is this here, sorry, you can't see it. Behind here, we have a value of something like 10,000 compared to these extremely small values. Huh? So the principal component just projects you out the leukocyte value. And the second principal component, you see has a value of 100 here and very small values here and back there 
the two fever values, they are also a little bit bigger than the others. So it's a combination of age and the fever values. And that's why we get such a picture without structure. But if we look at the normalized values, and that's what I saw when you showed it me, uh, that's the picture you get when you project, uh, when you normalize your data, calculate the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, and project on the two largest eigenvectors. That's the picture you get. Highly structured. And now let's let me ask the question, uh, what does this uh, structure tell us? I mean, or let me ask, what can you see here? I mean, it's just about pattern matching, nothing about PCA. If I would ask a 10-year-old kid, it would immediately give me an answer. Isn't this right part a copy of the left part? At least it's, it's very similar. Look at this uh, bunch here. It's almost exactly a copy of this, and this is copied here and so on. And where does this come from? Now look at this axis. Here we have zero, and here we have one. Now what's the reason for this almost identical copy? The reason is that many of our variables are binary. So our data points, there is, I mean each one of the binary variables here Take this variable here. I mean, a part of, of the data points have the value 1 here, and the others have the value 0. So this binary variable splits up our data in one set with the value 0 and another set with the value 1. Yeah? And now, if this variable is not really very significant in splitting up our data, maybe it's, it's not really relevant. So it's just, I have the data and half of them have the value 1 and the other half have the value 0. And this then leads to an almost identical copy. I mean, this is the part of the data with the value 0 and this is the part of the data with the value 1. And uh, I guess an explanation for this structure in here would be similar. But here we would have to look closer. I mean, we now could do the same thing and just use one of the binary variables and uh, neglect all the others. Okay, so you see it's PCA is a nice tool for data analysis. Okay, so much uh, about PCA. Um, and now we come into the next section. Um, we now go into um, uh, it's I mean we, we will have this semester this statistics chapter and then we will have a continuation of the function approximation chapter. And we are still in the statistics chapter, but 
This is kind of the overlap between statistics and function approximation. We will now in, uh, go into the statistical approach to function approximation, which is, I mean, this will give us powerful techniques for function approximation, first and second, it will lead to a much better understanding of what's going on. Yeah? So we will see, for example, problems with overfitting, but we will also see how we can solve them. Um, and the, I mean, the magic formula is Bayesian regression. Yeah? So we will use Bayesian statistics more or less based on the base formula and we will see, uh, we will learn a lot about uh, functional approximation. Um, but because it's a statistical um, method, we, ha we have to go a little bit into statistics. Yeah? Um, okay, so now we first uh, talk a little bit about estimators and their properties. Um, now here we talk about an estimator T gamma which, uh, which is used to estimate some unknown parameter gamma. Um, I mean, we may want to estimate the expected value, for example, of a distribution or the variance or some other quantity. Okay, so the estimator is a function that maps our sample x onto a set of, uh, no, the, this is the sample space, it maps from the sample space onto the parameter space. Yeah? Um, and uh, so one particular sample is a set of data points, yeah? x1 through xn. Okay, and now it's important such an estimator has uh, two desirable properties and uh, the first one which is really very important we want our estimators to be unbiased. And unbiased means that the expected value of the estimator is, gives us the exact value of the parameter. I mean, look, we are, we, we are, uh, we are calculating the estimator itself from a finite sample set. And this, of course, only gives us an estimation of our parameter. That's why it's called an estimator. And the question is, is this estimation good or not? And the first property is unbiasedness. And this means that the expected value of the estimator has to be the correct parameter value. The expected value is nothing but the limit for n towards infinity. So if we increase the size of our sample set and let n go to infinity, then uh, the limit has to be gamma. Okay, yes, and also of course if we take a finite sample set we would like to have, uh, oh no, sorry, even for infinite fi uh, sample set we want uh, our va the variance of our estimator to be as small as possible. Yeah. yeah. So such an estimator, uh, T gamma star has minimum variance if the variance of this estimator for the uh, uh, the parameter gamma is less than or equal to the variance of any other estimator, of any other unbiased estimator. Of course, I mean from this point on we talk about unbiased estimators and then we can ask how large is the variance of it. Okay, now let's look at uh, particular examples of estimators. Huh? 
The first and most important is the sample mean, you, you, uh, you all know it. And the, uh, the sample mean is an estimator for the expected value. The sample variance, what we have here, is an estimator for the variance. Um, and yes, uh, quite often people ask why do we have the 1 over n minus 1 here and not like here the 1 over n because this is nothing but averaging over a n sample points. And why don't we then normalize this sum uh, with the factor 1 over n? And the reason is here exactly because if we take 1 over n, then it's a biased estimator. It's only unbiased if we use this normalization. And this is one of your exercises to prove that this is an unbiased estimator. Okay. Now, um, yeah, let's look at uh, this estimation task. Um, so, oh yes, and let me mention, uh, these slides are, they are from Markus Schneider. Markus Schneider was one of the scientists in my group until about uh, two years ago. Yeah, I guess. Um, and uh, he prepared this part of the lecture, which uh, was actually an excellent job from him, and now I am happy to, to use his slides for this lecture. Um, and I mean, he is, uh, he is a researcher. He, did, he started doing his master thesis in this area, and we will actually see in maybe two weeks uh, the results of his master thesis. Um, where he used Gaussian processes. Okay, yeah, and now here, this is the, I mean, this is not about Gaussian processes, but about Gaussian distributions. Um, okay, so what we do here is, we sample from a Gaussian distribution. This green uh, graph here is a normal distribution with a mean of 5 and a variance of 2. So this is the mean 5 and here you see the width. Yeah? And we sample data points from this distribution. And now here in this first example we just take two samples. These are the blue dots here. We take these two samples. And now, I mean, now we take the statistics view. Now suppose we don't know this original underlying green distribution. We just know these two data points. And now our task is to estimate the shape of this density function. We don't know where these data points come from but we now estimate, um, yeah, what does estimation mean? We estimate the mean and the variance. And here you see it's not difficult estimating um, such a normal distribution. What you need to know is the mean and the variance. And what do you do? You calculate the sample mean and the sample mean is exactly here in the middle. And that's why the center of this black curve is exactly in the middle between these two data points. And then you calculate the sample variance and now you plot this black uh, curve. So this is now our estimated density and of course it's not surprising that from two data points we don't get a perfect estimate. Now if we take more data points, like 20 samples now, distributed like that, again 20 random independently drawn samples from 
the green density function and now we calculate mean and standard deviation and we get this new black density which is already quite close to the original density function and if we take even more samples if we take 1000 samples then you see we get a very good estimation and that's because we use um, unbiased estimators okay so I mean you have seen that it's actually trivial to estimate um, a normal distribution okay yeah oh yeah and here we have a proof of the unbiasedness of the sample mean and what do we have to show we have to show that the expected value of the mean is equal Oh, the expected value of the sample mean is equal to the mean of the underlying distribution so we calculate the expected value of the mean and now uh, then I mean we can pull this expected value into the sum because the expected value of a sum is the sum of the expected values because of the linearity of the expected value now we pull this expected value in here and now what is the expected value of all our variables xj it's of course mu so we have 1 over n times the sum uh, j equal 1 to n of mu and uh, you see this is then constant we can pull it out and then this gives us mu so this proof is very easy now let's prove the unbiasedness of the sample variance um, yeah in order to prove this um, we need to know this property so we can write the sample variance this is the sample variance we can write the sample variance in this form um, I mean this this part up to here this left part here this looks quite like the sample variance but if it were the sample variance this wouldn't be mu it would be it would be x bar because when you estimate uh, the variance from the sample you don't know the, the mean of the underlying distribution so the only thing you can do is you calculate the sample mean so this would be x bar but you can write the, the sample variance in this way look here appears the x bar huh? okay and this part of the proof is your exercise you have to show that this formula is identical to the sample variance um, okay so yeah now we can calculate the s the expected value of the sample variance and now this is the expected value of course of this formula so we can again draw the expected value into these sums uh, so into this sum and, and here and uh, yeah now look what do we have here the expected value of xj minus mu squared and this is nothing but the variance of xj um, and here we have the expected value of this other variable which is x bar minus mu and this is nothing but the variance of x bar yeah? so this is the the variance of the sample mean yeah and now now uh, let's look at this ah yeah of course here 
we see that um, so what do we see? Yeah, I mean this is uh, no, what is yeah, this is constant. The variance of xj is the same for all our variables xj. Yeah? Because these variables we assume that we draw them uh, independently from an identical distribution. So then of course the variance for all these vari variables is the same and I mean we can just take this constant value of the variance which is sigma squared um, and we get n times sigma squared that's what we get here. Uh -huh. And now here we have the variance of the mean and we already know from the central limit theorem that the variance of the mean is sigma squared over n. Okay, yeah, and now we are basically finished. Why are we finished? Because for n towards infinity this term goes to zero. Look, this n cancels out and then we have sigma squared divided by n minus 1. For n towards infinity this goes to zero. But this, of course, does not go to zero. Um, yeah. And you see, I mean, what is the limit of this? This goes to 1 for n towards infinity, so the limit is sigma squared. And now we have proven that uh, for n towards infinity the sample variance converges to the uh, variance of the distribution. Any questions? Okay. Um, yeah, okay. And uh, I mean, we don't prove this here. Um, the variance of the mean is, I mean, that's what we already know from the, um, the central limit theorem. And this is the variance of the sample variance. Huh? So how does the sample variance vary? And it goes proportional to sigma to the fourth power. Okay, some more nice formulas about expectations and covariances, and I yeah I think we will, will we will need uh, all these formulas. I mean this is basically the definition of the expected value of some function of our variable x. And that's how it's defined. I mean, it's, it's the integral over the, the density times our function uh, over the variable x. Okay, and here we have the definition of the variance of some function of x. Not the variance of x, but some function of x. I mean, we have seen examples uh, right before. I mean, one function of our variable is the mean, for example. Yeah? Okay, so the expected value of some function is the expected value of f of x minus the expected value of f of x, yeah, and this uh, difference is squared. And now it's easy to show that this is equal to the variance of f squared, uh, sorry, uh, to, uh, is equal to the expected value of f squared minus the expected value of f squared. That's easy to show. Um, yeah, and the covariance of two variables x and y is defined, yeah, I mean, maybe we should compare the variance and the covariance again. Yeah? Because, I mean, they are quite similar. Let's look at this first. This is the expected value of x minus e of x times y minus e of y. 
So this is the, uh, yeah, the difference between our variable and the expected value. So this tells us, um, yeah, for example, uh, So if this is the x-axis, and here we have um, e of x, the expected value. And now uh, suppose um, yeah, suppose we take one value x, which is here. And x is smaller than the expected value. So then x minus the expected value is negative. And now if we look at the axis for y, and we here we have e of y, and suppose y also is smaller than the expected value, then we see that for these two samples, um, here we have a negative uh, difference and here we have a negative difference. So the difference goes in the same direction, in negative direction. So we have then the product of two negative values which is positive. And this means the two variables are correlated. The difference from the expected value goes in the same direction. If they both go in positive direction, the product also is positive. But now suppose it's different x has a negative distance and y a positive distance, then I have a positive value times a negative value and I get something negative. And uh, such a negative term here um, is, we call it an anti-correlation. Okay, but now look we have uh, the expected value of this product. And now suppose we take two times the same uh, variable, x, and then we get the expected value of x minus e of x times x minus e of x. And so you see we get this here. So the covariance of a variable with itself is the variance of the variable. And here we have a similar formula to this up here which is the covariance of x and y is the expected value of the product x times y minus the product of the two expected values. Um, yes, so suppose our two variables x and y are uncorrelated Uncorrelated means the covariance is equal to zero. And then you see these two values have to be the same. So this means the expected value of the product of the two variables is equal to the product of the expected values. So, yeah, please remember this, we will need it quite soon. Okay, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, and here we, uh, we actually prove it, yeah. Yeah. If our variables are independent, then the probability for observing x and y uh, decomposes into the product of the two uh, densities. Yeah? I mean that's the definition of independence. And now we calculate e, the expected value of the product of these two guys which is the integral of the density times x times y and of course integrated over x and y because it depends on two variables. Yeah. And now here in this step, we now apply our independence. 
So we replace this by the product P of X times P of Y. And now you see that, of course, P of X only depends on X. This only depends on Y. And so we can split up the integral into two integrals. Into this first integral over Y and the second integral over X. And if you look at this, you see this is the expected value uh, of Y. And this is the expected value of X. So it results in E of X times E of Y. And we are finished. And uh, yeah, again, we see that for independent variables, uh, we get a covariance of zero. OK, yeah. Now let's look at Gaussian distributions. I mean, Gaussian dist distributions will be very important in this whole chapter. Um, we already looked at the Gaussian distribution for the one-dimensional case, but now we will need Gaussian distributions in higher dimensions. And now we will look at a few basic facts about Gaussian distributions, and then we will, uh, will apply them. And finally, in the last part, which is about Gaussian processes, we will even go to uh, Gaussian distributions of infinite dimensionality. So first we have a one-dimensional Gaussian distribution, then we have multi-dimensional, higher dimensional Gaussian distributions, and at the end we will learn about infinite dimensional Gaussian processes. But let's do it uh, slower. Okay, this is a nice uh, picture of such a Gaussian distribution, two-dimensional um, and here we have the definition. Um, okay, so a Gaussian distribution is specified by a mean vector now, of course. Uh, it's higher dimensional, so the mean is a vector. And um, the, the standard deviation or the variance is no longer one value. It is now the covariance matrix. Huh? Um, so we have the mean vector mu and the covariance uh, matrix sigma. And now this is the formula for the density function. And it's actually quite similar to what we had in the one-dimensional case. Um, in one dimensions, for example, here we had the square root of 2 pi. And here we have... To, we have uh, 2 pi to the power d half, and d is the dimension of our space. Okay, and here we have the determinant of the covariance matrix where we had before just uh, the standard deviation sigma. Um, yeah, it's the square root of the covariance matrix. Um, and in one dimensions, the square root of the determinant of the covariance matrix and in one dimension this would exactly be uh, the standard deviation sigma. And now comes the important uh, exponent. Now in the exponent we do have of course our vector x and you, you already see that I mean if we would multiply this vector with, our, uh, with a scalar um, standard deviation, this would give us problems because, I mean, this is the exponential function and this can only be applied to scalars, not to vectors. So the result of this whole formula here has to be a scalar. Huh? And that's how we uh, typically elegantly get a scalar out of a matrix and a vector. So you multiply this matrix from the left with the transpose of the vector and from the right with the vector and you end up with a scalar. Yeah, and also very, it's very important to see this is not the covariance matrix, it's the inverse of the covariance matrix. Maybe we should write down the one-dimensional case. So uh, n of mu comma 
sigma squared is equal to 1 over square root of 2 pi times sigma times e power minus um, x minus mu divided by sigma squared. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one dimensional formula. And you see, we have this sigma squared in the denominator. And uh, I mean, our covariance matrix, let's look at it in, let's say, two dimensions. Uh, then here we get sigma x squared, and here we get sigma y squared. Um, and I mean, here we get the two values, uh, the covariance. Uh, yeah, so here we get the covariance of x and y, and here we get the covariance of y and x. And since the covariance matrix, uh, covariance is symmetric, this matrix is symmetric. Okay, and for the case of one dimensions, what remains is this. And the inverse of this scalar matrix is this. Okay, so what we have to use is the inverse of the covariance matrix and we multiply it from the right with this column vector x minus mu which corresponds to this here. And from the left with x minus mu transpose. And then, oh, uh, we forgot this one half here. Yeah. This is very important. And maybe, yes, I mean, uh, please do as an exercise, look at this. I mean, this is written in vector notation. But now if you write down this in component notation, so if you want to know the ith component of the exponent, how does this look like? It, gets, it also gets a nice form and then you will... Oh yes, I mean, why don't you help me? I forgot a square, of course, here. Here we have a square. You see, I mean, this square corresponds to the product of this guy with this. And if you write, write down this whole thing in component notation, you will find the squares of the individual components of these vectors. And the, I mean, at this point, it's very important that you get exercise with all these formulas. Otherwise, you will get lost quite soon. Okay, so this is the formula for a function shaped like that. And we will, of course, now look at examples and details. But before we look at the examples, uh, let me note that the, uh, I mean, here we have mu and here we have sigma. And mu and sigma are the mean and the covariance matrix of this multidimensional distribution. But be careful, it has to be proven that this parameter mu here is the mean. Uh, sorry, is... Um, yeah, sorry. I mean, mu is, this mu here is the expected value, sorry. I mean, we are not talking about samples. Now, here we talk about the distribution, and mu is the expected value, and sigma is the covariance matrix. So this has to be replaced by expected value. And this has to be proven. 
And how will this be proven? And actually it will be an exercise for you to prove that the expected value of such a normal distribution is mu. How will this be proven? Yeah, you will just apply the definition. Let's go back. Um, here. You will take this formula. You will take this formula and replace this f of x by the normal distribution. And then you will solve this integral. And you will see that it is mu. And the same holds for the covariance. Oh yeah, okay, and here we have another remark. If the variables x1 through xd are all independent, then sigma is a diagonal matrix. Yeah, why is this the case? We have just talked about independence. Yeah, because the covariance of all pairs of variables is zero, but what is not zero? Yeah, the diagonal elements. And what are the diagonal elements of the covariance matrix? They are the variances of the individual variables. So the diagonal elements are the variances of x1 through xd. And now this is important. Look, our, uh, so, um, the covariance matrix um, for our variables x1 through xd so that now this is the covariance matrix. In the diagonal case, we get the variance of x1 down to the variance of xd. And the rest is all zero. Yeah. And this is, this is a very nice case for our normal distribution. Now suppose this sigma here and here is diagonal. Huh? Um, what is the determinant of a diagonal matrix? It's a product of all the diagonal elements. And now you see something very nice. It's a product of all these guys. And this determinant appears in the denominator. Now what is your first question when you see a denominator as a mathematician? It can be zero, yes. Now can this be zero, this product? Yes, it can. When can it be zero? If one yeah, if one of the variances is zero, then we are having a problem with our normal distribution. Now what does that mean? Let's go back to this nice image here of such a uh, Gaussian distribution. Oh, this is, yeah, this is not so nice an image for the case of a diagonal covariance matrix because here the covariance matrix is not diagonal. So if this is x and this is y, then here the covariance matrix is not diagonal. Let's look at such examples, no, let's go on, 
to this. Yeah. Here we have, look, here we have examples of Gaussian distributions all with diagonal covariance metrics. Um, and uh, the, the, um, the expected value is zero in all these three examples. And now look, with this covariance matrix, 1, 1, 0, 0, the density function looks like that. Yeah? Now, with 0.5 here, it is more narrow, but a little bit higher. And with 2, we have a larger variance, it looks like that. And now my question is, how would it look like? Let's take this one. And let's make this variance uh, to zero. How would it now look? Like the one dimensional case? Something yeah, something like the one dimensional case. I mean, it would be, if, if this second variance would be zero and this is the y direction, then it would be extremely flat. Yeah? The width would actually be zero. But that would mean the height would go to infinity because the whole two-dimensional integral over this density function has to be one. It has to be normalized. The sum of all probability density has to be 1. So it would be infinitely high. And that's why this is mathem mathematically not uh, tractable. So this limit for an extremely, for width 0, for variance 0, is not allowed. No? And that's what we see here. That's why it's not allowed. And the next point is, take this diagonal matrix and make one element in the diagonal equal to zero, then this matrix becomes singular. And so it's no, no longer possible to, uh, to invert it. And that's why this also doesn't exist in that case. Okay, so you see, um, it's important that all our variables at least in the diagonal case, have a variance which is not zero. Okay, so now suppose all these variances are non-zero. Um, then this exponent here gets a very nice shape. Do you see how the exponent then looks like? I mean, that's why I asked you to really look into this. Yeah? So take this vector formula and calculate one component, the ith component, and then you have to write down these multiplications as sums and you really see what happens. And now if you apply this to such a diagonal covariance matrix, then your exponent finally is minus one half times the sum of i equal one to d um, of sigma. So this is not a sum, it's the the covariance matrix sigma inverse i i times um, x i minus mu i. Okay? That's how the exponent then looks like. And now let's, let's write the whole thing. So we get x of this. And now, I mean this can be simplified very much. 
because now we have, oh, there is something missing. There is, of course, missing the square again here. Now we have the exponential function applied to a sum. And this can be written as the product of all the exponentials. The product of exp minus one half sigma i i inverse Oh, sorry, um, I mean, uh, yeah, this is, of course, that's how it has to be written. Uh, no, sorry. Sigma inverse diagonal element xi minus mu i squared yeah so now what do we have here I mean here we have the product of D one dimensional exponentials yeah? so we have the product of d one-dimensional normal distributions. Look, this is one-dimensional. Here we have, uh, uh, oh, danke. Here we have a scalar variable. This is just a number, i, i. Yeah? It's one element of the inverse matrix. So this is, this is a one-dimensional Gaussian. So you see, if our covariance matrix is diagonal, then our multidimensional Gaussian um, comes down to the product of the one dimensional Gaussians. Yeah, and I mean, this is just the basic fact that. If our variables are independent, then p of x and y is equal to p of x times p of y. Look, these one-dimensional exponentials, these one-dimensional normal distributions um, are the densities of the individual one-dimensional variables. And if these variables are independent, that's when the covariance matrix is diagonal, then our multidimensional Gaussian splits up in such an easy product. Yeah. And I mean, I mean what we see is that the mathematics of normal distributions is so nice because of this property of the exponential function that the exponential of a sum is the product of all the exponentials. And that's basically one of the, the main reasons why we like the normal distribution so much. Because the math is so easy with this. With any other distribution the math becomes much more difficult. But it's not the only reason. I mean, here we are really lucky in mathematics because uh, normal distributions are important in many applications. And why are they so important? Because of the central limit theorem. Because whenever we have variables um, no, when, yeah, when we have noise, we, when we have variables with noise, then quite often noise comes from, from a sum of random effects. Uh? And whenever we have a sum of random effects 
And if these random effects are independent and identically distributed, then we can apply the central limit theorem, which tells us that in the limit for n towards infinity, any distribution becomes a normal distribution when we sum up these random effects. Uh, um, so whenever we have, we have noise, we will now in the following make the assumption that it's Gaussian noise. And this assumption is not too bad because whenever our noise is really random and independent, then the distribution, the noise distribution, is very close to a Gaussian distribution. Uh, so we are really lucky now because Gaussian distributions are so important in statistics and second, they, are, they can easily be treated mathematically due to this property. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean there are more nice properties about the uh, normal distributions and exponentials, we will see them. Okay, now let's look at these images here. So here, of course, in two dimensions, this is a normal distribution uh, with, uh, the or, uh, with the expected value in the origin, and here in these pictures uh, we assume uh, diagonal covariance matrix uh, with variances equal to 1 in each direction and now you see it's shifted to the right in x direction uh, this is shifted diagonally in x and y direction um, and here you see we, we saw it already uh, three different uh, variances and yeah what's important is that Let's look at this. The variance in x and y direction is the same and that's why the contour lines here are circles. As soon as the variances are not the same in both directions, we will get ellipses. Um, oh yeah, do we have such an example? Let me see. No, sorry. Um, yeah, what we have here is, I mean, here you have a circle. If we would have, for example, three here in x direction and one here, then it would be an ellipse which is stretched in x direction. And now, here it's no longer diagonal. And that means our distribution will be turned around. So it will no longer be aligned in x or y direction. So here you see now it's exactly diagonal um, yeah. um, because I mean look this covariance here tells us that x and y are no longer independent. Yeah? They are now um, we do have a positive correlation between x and y. And positive correlation means that typically data will be distributed along this diagonal. Yeah? If we have a negative correlation, we would have something like that. So with minus 0.5 here and here, it would be aligned in this direction. And if, if this covariance is bigger, then this means we have a stronger correlation of these, t these two variables and then it's uh, stretched even more in this direction. So it gets m more narrow in this direction, but longer in this direction. Okay, yeah, here you see negative correlation and now it's stretched in this direction. Ah, yeah, okay, and here we have such an example with two different variances and now you see in x direction the variance is larger than in y direction but we also have um, a negative correlation and that's why so it's, it's no longer exactly in this direction it's a little bit shifted in this, in this direction. 
or it's rotated in this direction, not shifted. Okay, yeah. Some properties of the covariance matrix. I mean, you see, uh, we don't have the time to prove all this. Yeah? We will go towards uh, applications. So we ju I just uh, state some of these examples. They are not really difficult to prove, um, but here we will just state them. The covariance matrix sigma is symmetric. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is invertible and um, yeah, it is invertible um, if no variances are zero. Yeah? So if we have a width going to zero, then it's not invertible. So under this assumption, it's invertible. And the inverse matrix is symmetric too. I mean, this, this holds for all symmetric matrices. Um, all eigenvalues are real. This also holds for all symmetric uh, matrices. All the eigenvectors are orthogonal. Um, yeah, and the eigenvectors point in the direction of principal axis of the ellipsoid. I mean, that's what we actually have seen uh, in PCA. Yeah? Um, yeah, and another nice property, the covariance matrix is positive definite. Positive definite means that this product x transpose sigma x is greater than zero for all vectors x. All eigenvalues are positive. Um, and yeah, and the inverse is also positive definite. These are properties we will use. Okay, yeah, and uh, now the covariance matrix, because it's symmetric and positive definite, it can always be diagonalized. I guess we had this last semester in the linear algebra, didn't we? I guess so. So any symmetric positive definite matrix can be diagonalized um, by a so-called principal axis transformation. And this is the transformation we have. Yeah? So let u1 through ud be the eigenvectors of this matrix sigma. Um, then there is a transformation from our original variables x to new variables y with this formula. So yi, the ith component of our new vector, is the um, the i-th eigenvector transposed multiplied with x minus mu. Um, yeah. And this is a very important transformation because if we apply this transformation, look, I mean, two things happen. First, we have a, a shift into one direction of our distribution. Um, and you see what we get is we subtract the mu, the, the mean. The, uh, yeah, mu is the expected value of our Gaussian. So we subtract, uh, first we subtract the expected value. And that means for such a case, we would just shift our distribution into the origin. That's the first step. We shift it into the origin and then when we are in the origin, then what happens is we would rotate our distribution such that it becomes diagonal. And diagonal means that um, it's aligned parallel to the axis. Here it's diagonal, so this will, this will no longer occur. And aligned parallel to the axis means, it's this case, 
it means the covariance matrix is diagonal. And this, and that's very important, uh, this has the great advantage that in these, in these new coordinates, which we have here in these new y coordinates, all variables are independent. They are independent, they are uncorrelated, and this means you can apply this factorization of the normal distribution. So the whole normal distribution factorizes into a product of one-dimensional distributions. Okay, yeah. <coughs> uh, now some more results without proofs. Um, there even is a way to um, even if the variables are dependent. That's the case, so we have such a normal distribution, uh, so a first distribution with some uh, expected value and a covariance matrix which is not diagonal. And another distribution with a different expected value and different covariance matrix. Then uh, the product of these two uh, distributions can be represented as a new normal distribution. I mean, and this is really a nice result. That's a very nice result. I mean, this is not true for arbitrary distributions. Uh, so if you have a binomial distribution and you multiply it with a different binomial distribution, this is not a new binomial distribution. But for normal distributions, this holds. Um, yeah, and I mean there is one exercise, you really have to look at it yeah? and you have to see it and then uh, yeah, suppose, let's draw a picture. Suppose we have one normal distribution with contour lines like that. Yeah? And now suppose you have a second normal distribution that looks like this. And now you, uh, we, yeah, let's for a moment do something simpler. We just take the sum of these two normal distributions, which is kind of the linear superposition. What is the sum, how does the sum of these two normal distributions look like? I mean, the two distributions, here we have this hill stretched along this direction and a second hill stretched along this direction. And now what is the sum of these two guys? How would it look like? That's what you, what you have to do in your exercises. Yeah? So you take a, a plotting software and plot this guy and this guy and then you plot the sum of these two guys. Huh? And you will see how it looks like. I mean, it will be a hill which goes like that and here in the right angle it goes, it continues in this direction. And of course, such a hill with such a, a right angle here is by no means a normal distribution. So the sum of two normal distributions is not a normal distribution. But the product of two normal distributions is a normal distribution. How would the resulting normal distribution look like if you take the product of these two guys? It's a peak where they overlap. Yeah. It's quite a narrow peak. Something like that. Yeah? And all this part here will vanish. Why? And this also will vanish. Why? Because it's much better. Yeah. 
with almost zero. I mean, that's the, the property of the exponential function. It goes to zero extremely fast. So this distribution uh, at this point has a value extremely small. And I mean, this value is maybe, it's maybe five. Five times 10 power minus 25 is uh, very small. Okay, yeah. Um, so we can even multiply to arbitrary normal distributions with non-diagonal covariance matrices and we get a new normal distribution. I mean, that's a really nice result. Um, and there are even simple formulas for getting the new expected value and the new covariance matrix. This is the new covariance matrix. It's so simple. You take the two old covariance matrices and get the new one from this. And the new mean, that's how you get the new mean. I mean, proving this formula, this is not trivial because it's really technical going into the, uh, these, uh, look, I mean, yeah, we don't have it here, but uh, with these uh, vectors and matrices in the exponents and yeah. Okay, yeah, then next thing is marginalization. Um, did we, ha no, we didn't have this in the math lecture last semester, but we had it in AI. Yeah? So those who attended AI know what marginalization means. We did this with discrete variables. Now we have continuous variables and marginalization is it's nothing but projecting suppose we have this distribution it's nothing but projecting it onto a subspace. So if we have two dimensions we may project it to the x uh, dimension that's what, what, it's, uh, what it's all about. And in the discrete case, we get the, the, the marginal distribution. Look, we have two variables x and y, or even two vectors x and y. Um, and then we project it onto a subspace, onto x. And then what we did in the discrete case, we just took the sum over all the other variables. And here we, we take the integral over all the, the other variables. Okay, and now there, there again is a very nice formula for the normal distributions. So if we have such a normal distribution where the uh, expected value is a vector consisting of this first, I mean this A is a vector and B also is a vector. Um, and so it's a column vector where the upper part is A and the lower part is B. And the covariance matrix decomposes into such block matrices. Um, and now if we want to project this normal distribution onto this, these first dimensions. Then the projected, the marginal normal distribution is so simple. Look, it's just the normal distribution with this upper part of the expected value and with, the, with this sub-block matrix. It's so nice and easy. Okay, now we, we will also need conditional distributions. So we want to condition on some variables. So, uh, and this is the conditional distribution. P of x given y. And it's defined as P of x and y divided by P of y. And again, there is a nice and easy formula for normal distributions. If this is our normal distribution and we want to condition uh, y on x, then it's this normal distribution. 
with this expected value and this new covariance matrix. Okay, yeah, and now let's look at this picture. In this picture we see the difference between the marginal distribution and the conditional distribution. That's very important and we will really need this. This is our original two-dimensional distribution. Um, yeah, and if we look at the marginal distribution um, P of XA, so this is, this is the dimension XA and this is XB. And P of XA is this blue density function. Why is it? Now, look, project this distribution onto this axis. And what will you get? You will get exactly this. Is this clear? So it's just a projection. But now, if we take the conditional distribution, P of XA given XB equal to 0.7. Look, in a conditional distribution, we have to, in order to get a picture of the whole thing, we have to fix the second variable onto which we condition. Huh? So P of XA given that XB is equal to 0.7, I mean, then what we get is a cross-section at this line. And this cross-section, of course, is a distribution which is much more narrow with a, a standard deviation around this here. And that's why we get this red density function. Yeah. So it's, it's easy to imagine what happens when we do marginalization. So marginalization means we just project onto a subspace, then we get something like that. But if we do conditioning, conditioning means we fix some variables at a fixed uh, value um, and then we get kind of a cross-section uh, and that's this. Yeah. And, and I mean such uh, conditional distributions will be quite important in the following. Because sometimes we will fix some parameters to fixed values. To given fixed values and then that's what we get. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, and I guess we should stop now. Thank you.